First of all, thank you for joining us today with people from all over the world, Asia, Australia, Africa, Europe, Canada, North and South America. So thank you for that. What we will show uh, today is how you can apply agile practices for mainframe development that allows you to take advantage of modern infrastructure support, tooling, and faster delivery of change. What we will show is a fully automated uh, demo. And finally, this is available to run on any platform, be it Windows, Linux, SetOS, or Cloud, or a mix. So to start here, you have our three speakers. First, we have David from CloudBees. David is one of the driving forces behind the CloudBees score on AWS Quick Start, which provisions the CloudBees score environment on AWS. Then we have Gary. He is not only a distinguished microfocus enterprise DevOps engineer for IBM Z, but also one of the architects of the microfocus mainframe apps on AWS implementation. And then you have uh, myself, I am the founder and managing director of ICANN. Uh, before we really start, uh, I would like to give a special thank to a number of people, being David, Gary, who are presenting, but also Gerard, who prepared the demo and made sure everything will work nicely uh, together. Okay, so why are we having this conversation, this webinar? Well, it's all about and for mainframe organizations that are under pressure to deliver more, better, and faster. As you know, the software marketplace is changing rapidly. A combination of technology advances, evolving customer expectations, process evolutions, digitalization, and new business models are forcing executives to rethink prior IT strategies. Further decisions IT executives make on how to move forward will have a direct impact on differentiation, growth and scale, profitability, customer satisfaction, and speed to market. So the drive towards digital requires a smarter strategy for transformation, a strategy that enables adaptability to change while managing cost and risk. Michael Frogus, who we're partnering with on this webinar, identifies three key dimensions, the application, the process, and the infrastructure, or in other words, the what, the how, and the where of modernization. The what, namely, more mostly the application itself, the how, the software delivery process, the where, the underlying infrastructure. Three, thing, three things we will cover in this webinar uh, today. So today we will talk about how we see the mainframe process modernization that in our opinion has following objectives. It should allow you to respond faster to business change. It has to help you to improve the velocity by which new features are delivered to the customer. You have to leverage on-demand and scalable resources to manage costs. We need to tackle the skills issue and bring in new talents into the business. And of course, this taking into account cost, risk, quality, and the time to market. When we look especially at the mainframe, yeah, then we see that these challenges force enterprises, especially those with mainframe portfolios, to focus on how they transform the way that they plan, build, test, and release these applications to meet the requirements of the business. And to ensure that these business applications, often at the heart of the services these organizations provide, can evolve at the same pace as other parts of the business. Okay, solution overview. So we'll start with the infrastructure part that is provided by CloudBees. David will uh, tell us how CloudBees, from an infrastructure perspective, can help to cope with these challenges. Please, Thanks, David. Renee. Welcome. Appreciate it, Renee, uh, and and really appreciate you having me here for, and also for being a, a premier partner of CloudBees. Uh, on this slide, what we have is a feature overview of CloudBees Core. CloudBees Core is based on Jenkins, which is a popular open source automation tool. In today's demo, we won't be showing you the full platform. Instead, we'll be showing you a single master server as pictured on the bottom right. This is a good way to start using CloudBees you can install it on top of an existing Jenkins server, then add other components like Operations Center and additional master servers later on to form a complete platform. CloudBees Core runs just about anywhere, on-premise, in the cloud, or hybrid. It can run on virtual machines, on Kubernetes, and it can run wherever Java runs, including Linux and Windows. We'll be using Windows VMs in today's demo, 
But I have to say I'm super excited about CloudBee's recent support for Windows in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Very cool stuff happening there. Two important plugins are installed on the master server. The first is the ICANN ZOS plugin, which provides pipeline steps that orchestrate build, test, and deployment flows on mainframes. The second is the MicroFocus Application Automation Tools plugin, which integrates MicroFocus products with Jenkins. Note that in today's demo, the ICANN CLI is used, which allows CloudBees to orchestrate CI CD steps in ICANN. If you're interested in trying CloudBees Core, a 15 day free trial is available with our AWS Quick Start. It runs natively on Amazon EKS and it integrates with Amazon EC2 spot instances, which allow for a greater scale at a lower cost. Check it out. So next what we will um, see or have is a live demo that consists of four different parts. Um, we have prepared one use case. Of course, there are many use cases that uh, you can have with different setups and life cycles. Uh, what we will show you today runs uh, completely on the AWS cloud. So everything is running in the cloud uh, on several places in the, in the world. Um, so first we start with the first part. And here Gary will um, show us and will use Jira to define and follow up uh, what will be done. He will use Slack and or we will use Slack to communicate with uh, each other. And during the demo, um, Gary will use the MicroFocus Enterprise Developer for Z, which is an Eclipse-based integrated development environment. And he will also use the uh, MicroFocus Enterprise Analyzer during this uh, part. When he has done, he will commit his code to Git, and Git will automatically, as continuous integration, uh, trigger CloudBees Core that then will, let's say, uh, start the ICANN, uh, what we call a uh, level request. So Gary, please, up to you. Okay, so before we, we start, just a, a little background um, to cover off um, my part of, of MicroFocus. So I work for the business unit of MicroFocus that is known as Application Modernization and Connectivity. And specifically today, we're going to have a look at the enterprise product suite. Okay, and with that suite, we promote the offloading of mainframe development. Um, and we use that as a basis of introducing agile methodologies to that development process. And partnering with ICANN and, and then by extension, CloudBees was, was a logical step for us as the technologies provide, um, you know, a level of control around the pipeline, as well as a build and deployment process for the application from a single repository to multiple endpoints. Okay, so what you should be able to see on my screen now is um, the first piece of software that's involved in this process, and, and that's JIRA. Um, it's a very basic um, setup for JIRA for this demonstration today. But as ever with any change, um, we have to have a starting point, initialization for that. And in this case, we have um, a user story that we have defined for me to be able to make my change. The second part is um, our source repository. Now, in this case, we are using uh, GitLab. Um, and in here, we have a very um, basic setup. We have a master branch currently, and we have a development branch off which we're going to run our CI process. Um, a couple of things of note. Uh, one of the key parts, I think, to um, managing a development environment away from the host, the mainframe host, is to ensure that you maintain your metadata. Okay, so within this repository, um, we can uh, we have a set of metadata that supports the build process as we move forward. Okay, so this is enterprise developer. As Rene said, this is an Eclipse-based um, development environment. Now, the view you can see here um, is a bespoke view that we've created for my development organization. And we do this with workflow modeling capabilities that come um, with Enterprise Developer. And what it enables us to do is to create a single interface or a single tree view for all the technologies that are involved in our development process. So as a developer, I never have to leave my IDE to do my work. 
why is this important um, compared to say using um, plugins or whatever else that you, that are available for the technology well it, it's it's around um, simplicity uh, and adoption so it makes it easy for me I only have to learn one interface it's also important when we think about efficiency um, often many developers uh, talk to us and they say that a lot of their day is spent doing what I would call administration tasks um, moving between um, different technologies and passing information between them so they can do their job and um, so we try and combine those technologies together in a single view and more importantly um, allow those interfaces and those technologies to interact with each other to share information between each other to remove that um, level of admin and um, allow the systems to do the admin for us um, and that saves a lot of time and also obviously gives greater visibility throughout the process of the software development lifecycle. So if we have a look in here, um, I've got a Jira view, and when I create some, I will have views of my um, local Eclipse um, projects, COBOL projects where I'm gonna do my work. And I also have um, integration with Git. First, if we look at Jira, so I can have a look at some information. So I can see my an epic and I've got user stories and tasks. This information is um, retrieved from the Jira repository using uh, REST API. So the workflow modeling technology has REST API support to interactively pull the data that I need. Now in our environment, um, it's practice that as a developer, I can't work on any um, user story unless that user story is part of a an active sprint okay so I also have models a list of my active sprints so I can see my sprint here so my board with my active sprint and associated with that sprint is this user story so I can perform all of my work in context of my user story so I'm going to start some work so the first thing I need to do is to create a development project, but also at the same time, this process as a single click is going to create a feature branch um, for from the Git repository, um, both first locally, and then it will also push that to the remote repository. So from this panel, for um, traceability one of the things that we can do is use information from elsewhere to uh, push into this process so I'm going to reuse the JIRA um, entity ID to drive and name both my project and also the feature branch that I'm creating so we've automatically created an association between them I'm also my my local workspace project is created from a template so as a developer, um, I don't need to worry about any of the configuration. I don't have to worry about any of the metadata that I need to do my work. It's all driven through this process. Okay, just takes a couple of seconds to, to work. There you go. So now if we expand even further, I can see my local projects and here is my um, local workspace project that's been created for that and um, as you can see there's already an existing directory structure in which I'm going to work and we we get that directory structure from the GitLab repository okay so I need to do some work so we need to go and get some code so I can select um, code from my Git repository now in this particular case we're using um, a facility within um, Git called sparse checkout so typically those of you that work in mainframe environments will know that often the number of um, entities that are within an application uh, run in the tens or even hundreds of thousands you know so we don't really want to be in a position where we are pulling all of that into a local workspace project when I, actually I'm only changing a couple of programs so the sparse checkout and although it's reading the full repository so I can see every item within my repository. I'm actually only going to check out um, a couple of items. So in this first phase, I'm going to make a couple of minor changes. And you'll have to forgive us for being a little contrived because we're actually um, going to make a change that doesn't fix anything at all, just so that we can show you some of the integration later on in the demonstration. 
Okay, so I'll have a look at some copybooks as well. Just pick that one. Okay, so I've now, if we look into my structure, I've now got these the uh, COBOL member and I have the copybook member. So I'm going to make a very basic change here just to trigger the, um, the Git process so it understands I've made a change. Not actually any code at this point. There's something very simple, just so. And the same with the copybook. Okay, let's just make a change there. So now I've got some code changes that Git is going to recognize that need to be pushed. Okay, so I'm going to commit those changes um, so that we can um, trigger off the, the CI pipeline. So we have another action here. And again, this is a combination that one of the advantages of the workflow modeler is that I can combine functions under the covers so that as a developer, I just have to do um, very basic um, operations. In this case, um, we're going to perform the Git functions of um, add, commit, and then push. Okay. Now, this integration um, to Git is, is through what we call a function package, which is a, an API wrapper to um, the Git client. And the reason that we use Git above, say, maybe REST API into this, is that the Git client can then interact with uh, numerous Git-based repositories, whether that be GitLab, which we're doing here, or GitHub, or Bitbucket, or so on and so on. Okay, so it's, it's a, it makes the, um, this integration uh, a lot more flexible. So I'm going to execute that now. Okay, so if we quickly pop back to um, my GitLab repository, and now I look at my branches, you can see that this is my um, feature branch that's been created as part of this process. And if we just dive into it, just to, to be sure that I've actually made some changes here, um, we can see the changes um, with the commit message that I've made against the code. And also for traceability, as part of that commit message, we've, um, we've added uh, the JIRA entity ID. Okay, so we have that in the um, feature branch and we're now going to merge that feature branch with the develop branch to trigger the pipeline. So quick compare, create a merge request. Okay, submit that merge request. Okay, and then execute the merge. Okay, so what that will have done is merge that into the develop branch. We're then using um, the webhook capability within GitLab. So there is a webhook created that recognizes any push events to the develop branch. And from that triggers the CloudBees defined pipeline to start running and then um, work in combination with the ICANN ALM process. So that's the end of the first stage of this demonstration. So Rene, I'll pass back to you so we can start looking at that first pipeline. Okay, so now the, the second part, as I explained, uh, we have CloudBees um, core that is used in two perspectives, as orchestration engine for the whole devils process from build to deployment and also as initiator of the testing process. So CloudBees will start some ICANN ALM, um, what we call level requests, and it will execute um, itself the uh, unified functional testing from uh, MicroFocus. And once that is done, let's say the uh, first step what we do is we will build the COBOL code on Windows. Then we will deploy that to the uh, MicroFocus Enterprise test server. We will provision that uh, system and start in a uh, Kix region. And then CloudBees will initiate the MicroFocus UFT uh, tests and we will intercept the result. And normally in the demo, this will uh, fail. We will create automatically a Jira issue for uh, Gary. And we will also send a Slack message to um, Gary to uh, tell him what uh, went wrong. Uh, as this takes in a few minutes, um, a short intro on uh, ICANN ELM on the architecture. How do we work? 
Well, um, I can make uh, use of um, Ant script. So the, the uh, scripting language we are using are, is Ant. And based on Ant, we are creating phases. So phase allows you to just fill in the parameters that you, you need. And we use these phases to generate automatically the needed scripts for build and deployment. And this can be GCL for the mainframe, or a BAT file for Windows, or a shell script for a uh, Linux environment. The phases make use of models, like for instance, you have GCL models for the job card, compile cards, and you can customize these to your own uh, needs of your organization. And then they make uh, use of what we call resource files. By example, if you have uh, your uh, in-house PDS naming conventions in the resource files, you can put the qualifiers that you are uh, used to use. And when the phases are running, they will automatically uh, take the models and resources into account that uh, you have uh, predefined. And how does this work in reality? So I can then, will, let's say, look at the source file. So we have here a COBOL source file. If we look at it, it will scan that source to see, is it a COBOL program? Is it with CICS, DB2, is it PL1 or whatever? And it will uh, store these properties in a dedicated properties file. Then we will use that properties file in a second step to collect the uh, required uh, models for bat files, uh, GCL or uh, shell scripts. And it will generate, let's say, the, um, the um, script that you uh, need. And then we will use the resource files to fill in, let's say, the different parameters into uh, your script. And then finally, you will have the GCL or the shell script or the, um, the bat file how um, this is how this uh, works. Now we can have a look at our CloudBees. So we have in CloudBees, we have defined uh, two pipelines, one for doing the uh, second part of the demo and a second one to uh, do the fourth part of the demo. So when we look at this uh, pipeline, you see it's uh, running and we have a fail in the, the last step. So we do the Windows build, we deploy to the enterprise test server and then we run the uh, tests that have failed. And then normally, I think, Gary, you should have received a uh, Slack message. Yeah, that's right, Renny. Correct, OK. Yep. Then I will stop sharing, and then you can continue with the uh, third part. OK. So before we um, sort of jump into that, I had a, I had a, there was a question about whether um, we should have all the code within the GitLab repository. I think that's a complicated question, or maybe it's a complicated answer for a simple question. Um, but um, if, if we consider that GitLab is the master of our source code in this environment, then yes, um, then you should be controlling all of your source code within our repository. Whether you decide to have one single repository that has all of your application code in it, or whether you handle or work with multiple um, Git-based repositories um, will really depend of the size of the application that you're using. But, um, you know, for me, not just the source code, but, and we looked at, I talked about, um, you know, your metadata. I talked about, um, in this case, we have, um, so the UFT, the, so the test scripts um, are um, versioned within this. Um, there's, uh, we store information about the build um, and other elements that, um, pertain to enabling me to develop and test this application thoroughly. So, you know, this is moving towards the concept of infrastructure as code and not just the code itself. So hopefully that, that answers that question. Um, if you've got a particular environment involved, then we'd have to drive and have a look at that in a bit more detail. So back to our story, if I refresh my JIRA environment, we can see Oh, it's running a bit slow today. There you go. So we can see here a bug has been raised. So, um, so the the pipeline that you saw executed the test and it failed um, because I'm not very good at coding, obviously. So we we had a bug, and then you can see it was raised by Rene. So I can pick this up. I'm going to assign that to myself. Excuse me, and then um, just associate that with my active sprint just to um, refer back to slack so we use slack as our teaming our chat um, function so you can see a number of um, pieces of information that has come back from um, ICANN itself when it ran and 
So we can see that the build was okay, which is cool. Um, and it provisioned a process um, on enterprise test server. Uh, that uses um, some JSON web messages. So the enterprise test server has um, a process which enables you to um, provision a Kix region automatically using templates through some JSON web messages. Um, you know, so we deployed um, the package, in this case, the developed branch, we deployed everything from there. We started the region, ran the test, we stopped it, and we, we can see the failure message coming back. Okay, so if we refresh my sprint now, we can see that I've got this bug. So, okay, let's try and actually fix the code properly this time. So again, I need to create myself a um, development project to do the work, and as we did before, it's going to create a feature branch from the develop branch to m enable me to fix this. Entity being used, the entity ID, excuse me, is being used and the same template. Takes a couple of seconds, as I said before, there you go. Okay, so now I've got a new project in to do some work. So this time I'm gonna sort of make a, a bit more of a concerted effort to fix this change. So we need to check out some elements. So there's a couple of copy books, copy books that need to come out. So, um, and just for background, um, using the Enterprise Analyzer tool, one of my colleagues has done an impact analysis on this particular application based on this change request. Um, and it's, um, that's, what identified which programs need to be changed. And, and that is an automated process, very quick. Um, let's find the right one. All the way down, scroll down, there it is. Get there eventually. So do those. Um, I've got a couple of COBOL programs. So let's have a look in my repository and find those. So BBank70 was correct, but there's also a screen handling program that I need to change. Say OK. And finally, because this is a, a screen change, um, uh, there is a BMS macro that needs to be amended. So let's have a look for that. There it is, screen. And we can see that um, those entities have been checked out for me to use. I've got BMS and the two copy books. Now, as I didn't do a very good job um, of the change before, obviously I need a bit of help. So let's, um, I'm gonna use the tool to give me some help. One of the, the, the functions that's in Enterprise Analyzer is, is what we call code analysis. So um, here you can see out the box that I've got um, a number of default analysis scripts that can be run against my code um, for various things. So we, we can look at it for coding standards, um, or we can look at it for maybe performance. Um, but in this case, as I said, the analyst had run an impact analysis and, and that script is made available to me as a developer. So I can rerun that against the entities that I have in my local project. So I'm gonna do that. And it's running that analysis now. And as you can see, it's identified potential points of change. Okay, and if I click on one of these, then it's gonna show me those potential points of change within the code. Um, this is what we call knowledge at the point of change. And it's it al allows a developer or it allows um, anybody to work on this code that may not be totally familiar with it, okay, and um, be, be driven by the analysis. Okay, now what I don't want you to do is have to sit and watch me type the code changes in here. So in time honored um, tradition, I have a bit of a cheat where I've got a little utility that's going to actually modify the code for me correctly. Okay, so that's actually um, done all the updates. But one of the things I want to know is also there's an ongoing a sort of edict within the um, IT department that I work for, that we want to try and modernize the application, but also look at modernizing the way that we can test this. So one of the things that we can do with Enterprise Analyzer is identify areas of code, areas of native COBOL code that represent the real business function within this application. 
OK, rather than just dealing with the infrastructure code, the, the kicks calls or the database calls or whatever that may be. OK, and we've used that technology to then code slice that business logic into a separate um, module, which we have here. OK, and this is um, then just a COBOL program that's going to execute the, the specific elements. And as part of the change, I've then incorporated that instead of executing this code in stream, I can, um, I can test it separately. So what does that enable me to do? So one of the, the features that we have within um, Enterprise Developer is the ability to um, create COBOL unit tests. So I'm going to create a COBOL unit test for this particular new module. So I do that by new project type and a COBOL unit test project. OK, and I'm going to give that a name. And just because I like to be consistent, I'm going to make it associated with the, um, the previous project and, and therefore the, um, the bug ID. OK. And inside that um, unit test project, I'm going to create a unit test case. OK, give it a, a reasonable name. So it's going to be test. Um, let me get my fingers right. There you go. Uh, and I'm going to create a unit test for an existing program, which is in my project. So in that case, that one. And click finish. And that's automatically generated a test harness, a test case for me. And it works on a very basic principle, most test case, unit test cases. Um, and it does an initialization, an execution, and an assertion. Now, I need to add a, an actual genuine um, test case to this. And again, to avoid you having to watch me type it all, um, I've got a copy here, just so we, I can speed this up. OK, and I can save that. And then I can actually run that as a unit test. There we go. Run it as a COBOL unit test. OK, and it's executed my test. Now, ah, so look, this is a bit gobbledygook. And I know why. Because um, this is a mainframe application. So we need to make sure that it's actually working in EBSIDIC. So in my properties, um, because the default for my build for a unit test is native COBOL and therefore ASCII, but this is, we know this is a mainframe component, so I can quickly go in here, change this to EBSIDIC and say, I want to execute this in EBSIDIC. Apply that. There's an automatic build again of my case and I can um, run that unit test again. And in this case, it's run very quickly. And you can see the uh, two outputs that um, come from my unit test case. Um, it's important if you note that particular value, because we, when, we, when we look at um, the UFT test a bit later on, that's important, because this is the value that we're going to assert on. This is the value that we're expecting to see. Um, if you think about using something like this for your native code, if you compare to this, this particular um, function this this code function within the Kix application today if I wanted to test that it's about four screens into my application I have to log on I have to um, you know tab down to a couple of screens enter the values okay so I have to have a whole Kix environment behind me to be able to build that and, and test that okay but in this case I've managed to and I can execute multiple of these tests against this um, change that I've made very efficiently and also these test cases can be saved away and used at um, a later date. Just one final thing before um, I commit this change, I'm just going to show that I can actually um, debug this, both the, the unit test case and, and the code itself. Um, and this debugger is, is uh, available to all of the um, enterprise developers for, for all of the testing that, that you may do. Um, so I'm going to debug this as a COBOL unit test. And it's just going to switch to our 
um, debugging perspective. So this is a line by line debugger that you'll be familiar with, or hopefully you should be familiar with. Um, but I can, you know, I can do lots of things in here and I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time. I can mouse over values. Um, I can set breakpoints. I, you know, I can do all the things that you'd expect in a debugger. Um, in this case, um, as we step through, um, the variables tab is going to show me the, the relevant values for the line of code that I'm executing. So I can step through, set my values in here, and then it's going to actually execute the application program. And I can step through and do all of the things that I may do. I can do very detailed unit testing. Okay, well, I'm not going to step through the whole program. We can just run that, switch back to my um, perspective to have a look at that test case. And obviously it took a lot longer this time because I was stepping through it, um, but the results are the same. So um, that's just one of the features that you can use um, and take advantage of when you have an, a more agile development environment. So I've done my change. I've tested my change. So I'm confident now that the code that I've got um, is going to work. So I'm going to commit that again. So again, the same um, dual action. So I've got add and commit and push. And I just change the um, commit message. So I know that it's these particular changes. Say OK. OK, and if we just jump back to um, my GitLab repository here, as you can see, I've got this new um, feature branch that's related to the JIRA bug um, and I can have a look at my source and see that we've got some commits now um, around the code that I've just changed so I've got my vbank 70p and the new calc low function and I think right at the bottom somewhere there you go is the sbank 70p and just to double check um, if we look at the copybook changes that went through so we the new calc low, that's a new copy book. Excuse me, C bank dat, and hopefully have it down here. We've got mbank 70p was committed. Okay, so now we need to push this at our pipeline again, and we do that through the merge. So I'm going to quickly create a merge for this. So it's back into develop. Okay, create my merge request and Oops, submit that merge request. And actually do the merge. So as before, this will have initiated that webhook um, and then started off the CI pipeline. Okay, um, Renny, I'm gonna hand back to you. And the fourth part is again doing uh we're initiating the uh, cloud bees that initiates ICANN LM to do the build to provision the enterprise test server to run the tests. And if this goes well, the next uh, phase will start the uh, compile on the uh, mainframe. Uh, because this takes about 10 minutes, I just give you here a, s a simple example on how a uh, GCL step is generated using a resource file and using a model file. You see here the resource file where we, let's say, have predefined uh, when you are using a pre-compile for uh, kicks, uh, the model you are using, the program, the parameters, the copy lip, link module, return code you want, and the link lip. So you can really tailor this to your own uh, company standards. And then you have the model file, which are the GCL cards. And again, you can change these uh, models to your own standards, or if you would like to add cards, it's uh, fairly easy to do. And then using the phase, or the pipelines in uh, CloudBees, you will generate a GCL, or is it for, let's say, Windows or Linux, it will generate then the bat files or the, uh, or the scripts. Okay, so while we are um, waiting, I will go back to um, Jenkins, and we are here, let's say, seeing that he is running the same process again, but in the meantime, I can show you a bit of uh, ICANN ELM. So we can see here in ICANN ELM, uh, I will refresh the screen. So to start, this is what we see is, is what is called the desktop. And on the desktop, you can show the projects you are currently working on. Here we have, let's say, the uh, two pipelines that we have in um, CloudBees are the builds or the microfocus built on Windows, deployment to test, running the test, 
and then if everything uh, goes well built for the the mainframe so first thing that you do when you start uh, using iclm is uh, going to the global administration where you can uh, set up a number of things so you can define users and groups using ldap open directory you can define the machines that you're using to uh, manage the jobs uh, triggered by uh, ICAN LM. We have the transporters, so I can give an overview of uh, these. You can use standard FTP, you can use MFDAS, uh, local file copy. Um, so there are different uh, types that you can uh, use. Secure Shell is uh, another one. Version control repositories. So here we are using uh, in our project Git. And here it's fairly easy to define the uh, connection to your Git repository. You can test any connection. You see the connection uh, works. Same for issue tracking. We have a number of uh, possible issue tracking uh, systems. I don't think we have defined one here, but I can give you an overview of uh, some of these that we um, we support. So we have uh, Git. Also, let's say the former HP Quality Center a generic plugin. Also for a Team Forge from Colonet and Team Foundation Server from uh, Microfocus. Uh, here we have, let's say, the uh, phases. So once you have defined the phases, you can import them and use them in your uh, projects. I can here show you one of uh, the mainframe ones. So for instance, here for uh, update uh, kicks is a phase, and then you can, let's say, integrate this in your project, but I will show you that uh, immediately. Scheduling, again, we can have continuous integration so that every minute we look into Git subversion, what uh, has been, uh, if there is a change, and then the build will start uh, automatically. So when we look at the projects then, if here are uh, Cloudy's project, you can see that we have the built environments and we have the deploy environments. For instance, when you look at the deploy environments that we uh, defined, you see here a number of uh, them. And when I, um, Look at, for instance, for the mainframe, you see here the number of phases, uh, what that we run to um, come to a uh, result. So once you have set up your project, you will have the desktop and you can do everything through the web interface or you can also use the uh, command line interface, what we are doing, currently are doing now with um, Cloudis. So you see now that the built on the mainframe is currently running. And I will look at the former execution. So for everything we execute, we have here what we call the level request uh, detail, where we have a summary that you can see what uh, has uh, happened. Also the phase logs. So for every phase we run, you have in a uh, detail, like here we have, let's say, the build on the machine and the different uh, steps that we have. So like, for instance, here the uh, maps and the program compilation with the different events that um, happened. Then also when we have a build, we can have the results and you can tailor that archive to your own needs. Like here, for instance, we have the DLL files from our um, window uh, built normally. I'm sorry, we have the listing and all other relevant things. Again, you can customize this to your own needs or it, uh, what you would like to have in that uh, archive. Uh, I will immediately show you an approval so you can also make actions approval based if there is no approval you will not move to the uh, following uh, layer. Sources, it will show you the sources that we use for uh, this um, build. So you can see in detail what uh, is part and we can also see what has been modified uh, compared with the, uh, with the former uh, build. Here there are no modifications because it's a second one and it's uh, related to the, um, to the mainframe. And here I can also have a look at the build history so I can see what are the different steps and where I, where I am in my, uh, my process. So we're gonna go back now to see here in our first pipeline. And when I look here to the logs, I can see in CloudBees the tests that have been uh, run and I can have a look at my UFT report. And here I see the details, so I can see here where the uh, tests have been uh, running. And I can see here step by step what uh, happened. And as uh, Gary explained, so the uh, what we would like to see is here that the amounts that we have here are of course the same 
that uh, Harry Gatin is uh, tested here in his uh, development uh, environment. Okay, so I think while we are still waiting, I can um, show you, let's say, the architecture we are currently using on uh, Amazon based. And Gary, if you can comment this. So, I mean, it may, you may look at this and think it's, it's a complicated diagram. And, and to be honest, what I, I tell you to focus on here is the lines rather than the boxes. So what this sh is showing is the, the different connectivity points between the technologies involved. So we have um, Enterprise Developer, which is me as a developer based in the UK. Um, we have our CI server, which has ICANN and CloudBees and the Git client and a particular version of enterprise developer build tools, which is used for um, batch builds um, and automated builds of the application. We have our testing capacity and enterprise test server. Um, we have UFT and then um, as part of the process, we, um, we build an inter what we call an internet it's pull my teeth back in internet gateway and customer gateway between the um, virtual um, network the VPC within AWS um, back to the mainframe and this is this is done for security reasons so there are a couple of firewalls at this end and it, and it in our particular environment it uses a, a service called transit VPC it's a way of controlling the communication um, backwards and forwards between um, the mainframe and the environment in which you're running. And the way that, that AWS talk about this is really what you're doing is you're extending your corporate data center um, into the cloud. Um, so that's kind of the basis of, of the information we've got. And I've, I've got, because actually Kartik, I'll, I'll cover this now. Kartik raised a question, a follow up question to, my, to the first one about um, whether what you have to put into your GitLab. And he, he asked the question as, as, as whether, um, you know, people running mission critical applications would be confident or comfortable with having their code outside of the mainframe. Um, well, I, I would say the answer to that question is is yes, in the sense that um, I know we're showing you GitLab here, so this is it's a SaaS version, but we just do that for the demo environment because it's convenient. But um, there's no reason why your Git based repository cannot be housed with within the security boundaries of your data center. So in that sense, I don't see how it is any less secure than having it on your mainframe because it's still part of your corporate data center. Okay. So just to, to add to Gary, uh, we are doing now this webinar and David is in New York, US. I'm in Belgium and uh, Gary is uh, staying in the UK. And we have, let's say the infrastructure Let's say this will be all over the world. Parts are, I think, in the US, parts are here in, in Europe. So uh, you can easily uh, use this from wherever you uh, you are. Could yes. You so as uh, Gerard is uh, just asking for this, um, uh, we have, let's say, an, an approval mechanism. So in here, before I can uh, deploy to my quality environment, I need to give an approval. Yeah? You see here, uh, awaiting pre-approval. I can open my uh, outstanding approval screen, one item found, and of course I can approve or disapprove. Uh, we say here it's okay, so it's approved. And then when you go back to the desktop, you will see that now uh, the uh, deployment to the uh, quality uh, environment is up and running. So when you go back to our uh, CloudBees, If here our second pipeline that we see is running is now doing the deployment to the uh, quality environment. And then as a last step, and this is just for demo purposes because in reality, I don't think you will uh, uh, do it uh, this way. We deploy in the production again in a uh, Windows environment. So, but again, it's up to you to set up how you want your life cycle and on what platforms uh, you are running or you want to, uh, to run this. So while it's still uh, waiting for to finish, I suggest if there are any questions. Yeah, hi Ren, this is Karthik. So how different it is to use uh, cloud base because we already have this open source Jenkins. I'm just uh, so, you know curious to know why do we need to go for an enterprise edition? Okay, David, can you answer that question? Yeah, sure. Hi Karthik. 
Uh, I've, I've got a long answer and a, and a short answer for that. <laughs> Um, what comes to mind is, is CloudBees is especially useful for companies who need to operate Jenkins at scale. Uh, beyond just using a single Jenkins server for a single team, CloudBees helps to scale Jenkins across an entire enterprise and utilize Jenkins among many teams. Now, where it's especially useful, I think, is, is helping companies to keep their Jenkins servers smaller and, and therefore more efficient. And one unique thing about CloudBees is Operations Center that you saw earlier in my slide, uh, which helps to create a platform out of all these Jenkins servers and make sure that each one is, is doing what it's supposed to, is, is that it's properly managed, that backups are taking place, that security roles are correct, that credentials are shared in the right places, all these great features uh, that, that are needed when you take Jenkins to a, a very large scale. Does that answer your question? Yeah, got it. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Any other question? So basically, when you are uh, taking us through the uh, demo, I noticed somewhere in GitLab that uh, I think you have to write a webhook uh, to communicate with the uh, MicroFocus Explorer. Um, so how do you basically define a webhook? Uh, do you have to define it in GitLab or do you have to define on the host site? Gary, can you answer that question? It, yeah, in, in this particular instance, the webhook is between um, GitLab and um, the, the, the CloudBees core Jenkins pipeline. So um, it's defined in GitLab. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, got it, Gary. Thank you. So that can be done dynamically. So, I mean, in this case, we've defined it statically, but um, in other iterations of our demo, um, because GitLab is, is, is the same as a lot of technology today has... Um, you know, REST API support, then um, in a dynamic environment, if you had multiple, um, you know, pipelines and the, and you, you want flexibility, then those um, webhooks can be defined dynamically. And also, let's say, to link the uh, second pipeline to the first pipeline, uh, we used a uh, post-built action uh, in CloudBees. So when the uh, first part went uh, well, so the test passed, we automatically, through the post-built action, uh, started the uh, home pipe for the mainframe. We've got a question in the chat, and it says, what about dependencies? And it says, Let, let's say I change a copybook. How is it determined what needs to be recompiled on the mainframe? OK, that's cool. That's a cool question, and I'm glad you asked that, because we have a good answer. Um, what we use, I, I mentioned um, the Enterprise Analyzer product. So that's a repository, a source code repository that um, maintains and understands all the dependencies between um, all of the components within an application. So in this case, um, when the, if a dependency is changed, then um, I can, as part of the build process, as a pre-step to the build, communicates with Enterprise Analyzer um, and says, it, what, are, what programs are used by this dependency? Okay, so if you change the dependency, then it feeds a, a list into the ICAM build process to say all of these programs must be compiled to. So that's how that works. Any other question? I think Gerard wants me to show the Slack process at the end. I will uh, show his request. Okay, so have we look here? This is my Slack output. So um, coming back, we saw a much more successful run this time. So that was the failure from the first pass. Um, when we committed it. So that's the build results worked. Okay. This time we got a success from the build after all of the provision and execution and then we can see so for the mainframe um, to the test system it, it was built and deployed. Okay, and then the quality and then finally um, through to production, which is um, really good. So there you go. Those are the Those are the messages that come back through slack, especially for you Gerard So the big question why CloudBees, MicroFocus, and ICANN? Well, uh, why should you listen to us? So, well, there is a broad category of challenges, we think. The first of these broad categories of challenges relates to the developers themselves. Um, developers are teams uh, that are modernizing applications to deliver new services or maintaining applications to ensure that <clears throat> systems can remain compliant with the latest regulations or customer demands. The more efficient these teams are, the more chance that can change, sorry, that can be delivered to the business. So what is holding them back? I think what we showed today 
should certainly help with uh, that. Also, when you look at the existing development tools, the infrastructure and the processes that are limiting the efficiency of the development teams, it may well be that the development group is as efficient as they possibly can under the current restrictions, but that still isn't enough to meet the new demands PM asks of them. So I think, again, if you look at what Gary showed in, in what is called the shift left um, movement that you can do a lot already as a developer so that you save time in the following process or avoid that you have to um, rework uh, things. Uh, especially when testing is happening too late in the delivery cycle um, because the testing capacity is limited. Uh, that results then in rework and delays and uh, additional costs. Then also do your development pipelines now consist of many different tools with little or no integration. So I think what we show today is a fully integrated uh, solution based on the CloudBees uh, platform that um, gives you scalability or the ability to, uh, to easily uh, scale. And then let's say a process, we have given you one specific use case, but you can apply your own process. So we adapt ourselves to your process. You don't have to adapt your, to, to our uh, processes so that these things are not slowing down the transition to the uh, more agile um, methodologies. So when we look at what is in really in for you, I think that our key message is that you can safely modernize and have agile practices for uh, mainframes. Yes, you can move your legacy applications onto a modern infrastructure with CloudBees, with the microfocus tooling and the ICANN CICD uh, solution. And doing this, uh, by doing this, you can be sure that you can master the cost, that you can manage your risk, you will have high quality of applications and you have more frequent uh, deploys. Or summarized, you will gain significant business value in the form of that agility, new business capabilities and a reduction in total cost of ownership and risk. Using our uh, solution, you will transform the way you plan, build, test, release, and operate your applications. And through innovation based on what uh, already works. So you will reuse your existing legacy application, but you will just use them in a more modern uh, way. And if for people that still have questions about the importance and future of mainframe code, well, if you see here the IDC uh, figures, 85% of the core applications remain strategic today and tomorrow. The impact of IT failures is huge. We talk about 1.7 trillion US dollars per year, and still more than 70% of projects are uh, failing. So as a closing statement, this is what I call the call to action. Um, now that we are all, I hope, convinced that you can safely modernize, we need to start a journey. And for that, we have a uh, special offering. So with uh, our experts, that are on standby for you to spend time with you to discuss and assess what you are looking to do and how we can help you to start that uh, journey. It's a service uh, that is offered and the name is Value Profile Meeting. It will ask the right questions and it will help you to determine the right next steps for you. Important, it's completely free of charge. So the only question we have is when can we start? Just let us uh, know when uh, we can start. If you have questions regarding CloudBees, regarding Microfocus or ICANN, please contact David, Eddie or uh, myself. And or if you have a generic question, you can contact one of the three of us and we will, uh, let's say, certainly come, um, come back to you. Yeah, we've got a couple more questions. So we've got one here from uh, Mohammed, who's asking us, what does the build, Jenkins or ICANN? Well, actually, probably the simple answer to that is actually all three parts are involved in the build process. CloudBees. Um, is is it's defined in the pipeline, um, which then um, talks to the execution engine within um, ICANN ALM. But all, the actual build, if you're talking about the local build, the, the, the microfocus build, that's also interacting with microfocus technology. So it uses um, our extended version of Apache Ant to then execute the build of the components. Um, for the mainframe build, okay, then um, we. The, it's the standard IBM COBOL on the mainframe. So we're executing, we push the code at the mainframe and, it, and it's um, executing the standard RJ Cruttle and all the bits and pieces that would, you would use on the mainframe. Then there was a follow-up question to that from Mohammed again, is, is that because Jenkins cannot trigger builds on the mainframe? I wouldn't want to say can't. 
um, because that would be disingenuous, but it's it's the level of control and orchestration that ICANN and Cloudbees bring to the conversation. So yes, um, you could, if you wanted to, sit down and write your own groovy script using um, all sorts of different other technologies to come up with a build process. But, um, you know, the amount of effort that, that goes into that is, is considerable and you've got to maintain it. So that's where using something, you know, the combination of ICANN and um, on top of the other things that those technologies bring. So it's not just that, um, you know, there's there's features that Rene hasn't mentioned yet within, within ICANN about auditability and all of those sort of things, particularly if you're working in the financial industry that you need to do around your build. So there's a lot of work to, to use a, a a build process so and that's all encompassed in in what you get with ICANN LM and, and Cloudbees so hopefully I've covered that off I don't know if Rene if you wanted to add anything to that that's okay thank you Gary it's uh, it's indeed true that when you look at uh, let's say you can trigger everything from um, Cloudbees um, but in fact the, the real intelligence is in ICANN ELM where we have the uh, full handling of the mainframe and like Jerry, uh, Gary just uh, mentions, also the auditing and logging. We have customers that especially um, buy our solution for audit reasons so that they can, at the end of the year, can see uh, who changed what, why, when, and, and, uh, and these things. Uh, there was also a question regarding the um, download of the PowerPoint and the uh, webinar. Yes, uh, I will send you a copy of the PowerPoint and we will also make available the uh, recording uh, to all of you. And if, let's say, in, in, uh, later you have questions that you didn't think of, please do not hesitate. You can send us the question through mail, and we will uh, answer them uh, as soon as possible. Okay, there's another question here, and I'm not sure we'll be able to... Does Microfocus comes with Cloudbees? Well, the simple answer to that question is no, um, because it, obviously we're, we're separate vendors. It's just that we have... Um, the ability to to interact with each other as as i think david mentioned there is a number of plugins that, that cloudbees can use to interact with various of the microfocus technologies and this is what's the additional infrastructure cost for this oh, the silver I, I mean that's a really difficult question to to ask to answer at this point because i don't know um the extent of the environment that you're looking at so that would be as part of that discovery element that, that renee's talked about i think that's where we could start drilling into that type of um question yeah um you know because that's a how long is a piece of string question depending i don't know anything about your environment so i think it would be difficult to answer that at this stage gary this is david i could try to address that um the additional cost for infrastructure when using cloudbees can be no different than the cost of your ci cd implementation today uh the the short answer is it, it depends um, as you saw in the feature overview diagram earlier, there is an additional component in CloudBees called Operations Center. So that would be an additional VM, perhaps an additional pod in Kubernetes, depending on how you run CloudBees. Uh, but the general answer is the infrastructure cost is uh, the same, but you might find that CloudBees helps you scale your Jenkins implementation uh, very well. So you might go from having one very large Jenkins server to having, let's say, five or ten much smaller ones. Uh, so therefore, the, each one would use less infrastructure, but uh, overall, you might have a, a bigger landscape of tools. So again, it depends. Uh, and of course, there is also a licensing cost with CloudBees. Please contact our sales. Uh, that's sales at cloudbees.com, or you can check our website to inquire about that. Okay. And just an additional thought on that. Obviously, you have to bear in mind that what we're doing here is we've removed the development and much of the testing um, away from the mainframe. So you are consuming less um, MIPS, MSUs, whichever way you want to look at it um, on the mainframe today. Now, depending on your um, the actual contract with IBM, it, it's difficult to then estimate what that cost saving would be. Um, it may well be you just don't need to upgrade your machine. Um, so... Um, that, that there is definitely some offset of the cost. If you obviously, the, you know, the, the compute capacity that you need to run a, the development environment is is a cost, but it, there is a saving against the mainframe. Hopefully, that that covered everything. Last but not least, thank you very much for being here. And as we say, to remember, you can apply the agile practices for ZOS mainframes easily. Yes, you can move your legacy applications into a modern infrastructure, as Gary said. 
take it completely away from the mainframe, but keep all the goods that you had on the mainframe. And yes, you can do this with CloudBees, Microfocus, and ICANN. And yes, together we can do this. Thank you very much for being here and have a nice rest of the day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody.